thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination, cultivating true contentment, the art of living a life of quality over quantity. Visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, at our simplified URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com to find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment. From a Monday motivational post, recipes, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content, and readers' favorite regular weekly post, This and That, which is posted each Friday morning. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast and welcome to episode 361. I have been most eager to share the content of today's episode. For one reason, if I was speaking to you about it, it meant that the house, Le Papillon, where I live in Bend, Oregon, is complete. And also because I have learned so much and as much as it was a journey of creating a sanctuary that I love and that nurtures me, it's also been a growth opportunity, full of opportunities to grow. (laughs) And I want to pass along some discoveries that I've made, some ahas and a lot of encouragement because It can be, I don't want to say intimidating, but it can be, appear to be daunting to take on construction in your home, especially if it is just you, for example, if it's just me in my home, as you all know, not just me, it is me in my home. And so that's also, there's a lot of freedom and liberation in that because I am the only one making the decisions, but I'm also the one responsible for making sure this gets done. Um, to a way that I am pleased. And I feel as though my investment was worth both the time and the money. So there's a lot of um, hopeful, uh, hopefully insights and uh, uh, answers to questions you might have. And um, feel free to email me after this episode or if you begin your journey later um, and remodeling or customizing your house, um, I'm happy to communicate with you directly if I can help. And if I can't, hopefully point you in the direction to help you out. So if you're wondering why the audio is a little bit different for this episode, um, it is because I am actually not using my typical mixer. My mixer broke on me and I am waiting for my new um, uh, audio item. And so what I've decided to do, and you might hear Nell in the background, we are sitting in my walk-in closet with both dogs because of course they want to know where I'm at. And so I just brought them in here with me and she's making a nest um, in (laughs) the closet trying to figure out how to get comfortable for the next hour or so of our conversation. So I'm going to let her do that, and we'll get into this list of 33 decorating and construction lessons I learned customizing Le Papillon, my home in Bend, Oregon, a three-year journey. And with regards to this week's Petit Plaisir, I have two for you, one for the Anglophile and one for those escaping to the seaside. After all, it is summer. So stay tuned for both of those at the end of today's episode. So on the show notes today, you'll notice that I just list all of these 33 um, lessons. And 
the reason for that is because I encourage you to tune into where you are now to listen to the audio, because I'm going to talk in depth in such a way that would just make for a very, very long post on the blog. So hopefully you're tuning in here and let's get into breaking down the lesson. So just to recap, for those of you that may be new to the podcast, um, I purchased Le Papillon back in August 2019. Um, in Bend, Oregon. And while a lovely house, it's 1500 square feet. Um, it was built in 2015. So not that old and had only one family that had lived in it prior to myself. I basically had a blank canvas to customize to my liking. I didn't have nothing. Everything was functioning. Now I had the opportunity to just tailor it. And I knew immediately what I was going to do on in certain rooms. Um, and as you also know, a lot of the tours of these rooms that we're going to talk about, if not all of them, um, minus one, there's one more coming at the end of this month, um, are on the blog in the archives under La Papillon. And if you're a top tier member, you can tour in detail the before, after picks, my objectives, detailed sourcing. Each of the posts are very, very specific and walk you through exactly what I did. Um, again, that is one of the exclusive benefits of being a top tier member. There are, to my account, about 15 tour posts right now um, with more coming. So let's get into this list. I've broken it, broken it down into three categories. The first category is making the best decisions for you and your home. The second category is working with others, whether that be contractors, designers, or subcontractors, etc. And the third is skills that will give you options. So I've tried to make it a bit more organized so you can, you know, hone in on what you're trying to understand or explore or to strengthen in your journey of customization of your home. So, okay, so 2019, uh, August 2019, I moved in September 1st, 2019. And uh, you all know that the pandemic began in March 2020. But I had already gotten a hold of my contractor in the fall of 2019 and started to get started the first big project, which was my kitchen, as many of you know. Um, and so the stove had been ordered, details had already been ordered before the pandemic had begun. So I was in it. I had, <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily stuck. I was actually very grateful that I had already started because it was something that I could really focus on for the next two um, to three years. Unbeknownst to me, I thought I was just going to do one project, um, the kitchen, and it just kept going. Um, but now it is done. Um, it is done in the sense that I am done working with contractors. I am done working with designers, interior designers. I am done working with people um, that know more than I do so that now I can take that expertise that I've gained. And if there's anything else I can need to do, I know how to be the direct contact to anyone I need to help me out. So Let's start with making the best decisions for you and your house journey. First of all, and this is going to surprise no one, number one, patience is key for knowing what will work best. Part of the reason um, this took three years is because there were rooms I just didn't know yet, but I knew something was going to have to happen. So for example, in my office, I knew that I wanted arts and crafts wallpaper, and when I chose that, which was actually very early in the game. I was in 2021. I still had no clue what the window curtains or the window treatments were going to be. I went back and forth between blinds, like wooden blinds or, or curtains. And I, and I really didn't know if I did curtains, what color or print would work well. And so that didn't get finished until this past spring, specifically June, 2023. But when I knew, when I discovered the curtain fabric, I knew. And so I worked in that room for the whole duration of this. So three, um, now almost four years. And I really got a feel for how to live in that space and how I wanted to feel in that room. And so while you don't have to give yourself 10 years, you know, long, you don't have to give yourself so, so many years. If you don't know, don't push yourself to make a decision. Don't stop exploring because that's you're not going to find the answer unless you're looking, you're searching. And it doesn't even have to be a direct search. Just keep your eyes open. You never know. In fact, how I came upon the curtain fabric for my office was not because I was looking for it. I was looking for curtain fabric 
for my kitchen door that leads out into my garden porch. And I knew I wanted a door curtain and I found the fabric for that. And as I was going through that uh, business's fabric options, I came across this fabric for my office. I said, actually, I didn't come across it for my office. I came across it and I said, I think that would work really well in my office. And it was that fabric. So part of the successful journey of being patient is knowing what you want or need Um, generally speaking, I needed curtains. I had finally decided it was going to be curtains and then just keeping your eyes open. It will come to you. And when you know, you know, and you're not going to waver, but if you don't know, don't purchase it. Don't invest yet. Wait, have patience, live a little bit longer in that space. And when you figure it out, you're going to be glad you did wait because you're going to love it. And you're probably not going to change it for many, 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 many years, if ever. Okay. So that's number one. I'll probably re- return to that often because it really plays a key. Um, uh, it's a key characteristic or skill you're going to bring with you through this whole journey. Number two, if you aren't sure yet, and this does tie into number one, keep searching. It will pounce on you when you do come across it. I want to give another example of this just to really drill down on the truth of this that took me a while to trust, but this house has really taught me this lesson to be true. So I was trying to come up with a fabric for um, my door curtain, um, and it's just a small little, uh, it's like 24 by 12 inches. There's a little window on my front door, and I wanted a little curtain on the interior side for privacy, but I needed the right fabric. And I went through, I mean, Veronique, my friend who was an interior designer here in Bend, she has since moved. She's now in Spain. But she sent me home with, I think, 10 or 12 fabric swatch books. And I went through literally every single one. And I did postmark. I would put post-its on the ones that I thought maybe. I probably posted it probably 20 or so. And I would hang, hold them up there to the wallpaper, to the door, the, the finish of the wood door. And I would hem and haw. And then I narrowed it down to five. But none of them really spoke to me. I kind of decided on one, but it just didn't make me smile. It wasn't a full-blown, woohoo, this is going to look fantastic. And then another example of it pouncing on you, back to that kitchen door curtain that was the same company's fabric. And I had I had um, been looking at a couple of the different colorways of this one tweed print for the kitchen door. But the kitchen door's fabric was already solidified. So this one took a second. It was a second option, but it wasn't my go-to option. And Veronique said, oh, I thought that was the one you wanted for your foyer. And I looked at it again. I hadn't even considered it for my foyer. But just her saying that sent me back home, had me, I put it up on the door next to the wallpaper, and it was an immediate yes. And I was like, oh my God, this is it. But it helped that she saw something that she knew I was looking for and I wasn't even considering it. So that might happen too. You, You bring some fabric home for your living room, for the furniture in your living room, and you decide, oh, that actually works better in the, for the chair in the bedroom or whatever. So be willing to kind of open the options up for where fabric might sing to you. That's two. Three, choose an item when you're designing a room or, or a vignette, Choose one item that is a star of the show. This could be a piece of furniture, like a chair, could be a window, does not need to be furniture, could be a window and how you frame that window because of the borrowed landscape that you look out onto, or maybe it's your garden that you look out onto. It's just so captivating and entrancing that you want to make sure that is the star of your your room or it could be a work of art or it could be a utensil such as the stove and we'll talk about that in a second but this will help you make better decisions if you know what the star of your room is then everything else is the supporting cast. This is something I talked about in a recent interview when I was the guest um, on decorating tips and tricks with Anita Joyce. And I'll link to that podcast episode. I had a wonderful time talking about a few things I've learned on this journey of decorating for budgeting as well as just for making the best decisions. Um, but that that has helped me figure out what to, to invest in but also to make sure nothing is too much. So case in point, my kitchen um, has 
it was the first big purchase item for my house. It was it's a La Cornu stove. It's their Cornu Fay line, so their home line, not their chateau line. Um, but it is a two oven stove and it is blue, um, a provincial blue. And so because it's a blue stove and it's an open plan living space, I knew everything else had to be supporting that stove. So no other colors that are bright and bold. I have grays, I have soft whites, and then hardwood floors, um, marble-esque countertops. They're not actual true marble. They look, they're faux marble countertops. Um, and the counter and the cabinets are white with brass uh, fixtures. So that, that stove is what you notice. And it should be. It is why I'm in there. It's what is part of my business. And so think about it through that lens. What do you use most? What do you love most? What is what is signature to you? Um, another example um, would be your living room. Um, so say in your reading nook, uh, you want the fabric to work with the wall or vice versa. But what fabric do you get? Well, for me, the chairs have been the stars. So my chair, I have a, a green striped chair. It's an old vintage chair handed down two or three times. Um, I eventually got it from my mom. And it is some very old fabric. Um, it has not been recovered. It's just a unique, lovely, old, tattered chair. And the dogs love it. And so I, that was the guiding premise. Whatever curtains I chose, that green or the fabric had to be solid so it wasn't too shocking and it co had to complement that chair, um, had to work in that corner with that chair because the chair was going to be the star. The walls are uh, a soft but deep gray and the curtains are a silk deep green, but they're solid. So again, think about what works in the room, but also what is the star and it helps you to not go overboard with the other items. So that's number three. Number four, I mentioned in my kitchen that I have brass uh, fixtures. Um, and I think it's important to kind of just be aware when you're making new purchases um, that you don't have to have all shiny brass if that's your first option or your first choice. You know, maybe you have some antique brass and maybe you have, you know, they're all somewhat similar than uh, actual metal, but maybe the finishes are slightly different. And again, this could be the same for one room. They could be the same for one room, but maybe in the next room they're brass, but they're not shiny. They're um, poly, um, uh, antique or, or the idea is you don't want to go from nickel to brass. You don't want to go from black to, to silver. You want to make sure it's all within the same family. Number one, this creates a continuity throughout your home. It also creates, if you're trying to create a certain era, um, like I'm trying to speak to my, my passion for arts and crafts movement, um, a movement that would not have had silver. <laughs> That's a much more modern um, use uh, of a fixture finish. And so it's, it's adhering to the same family of finishes, um, and metal choices. Um, so keep that in mind too, as you invest, as you make decisions, I don't have all of my doorknobs swapped out yet that are nickel. Cause the house came with nickel, all nickel furniture finishes, which is case in point right there. The house came with all nickel finishes. So it was consistent. It fit that modern vibe, which is very popular in Bend, um, but it's just not for me. So I'm gradually swapping all those out to some kind of a brass finish. Number five, let's talk about this one for a minute. And I talked a bit about it in my conversation with Anita Joyce and decorating tips and tricks, but I think it's so important. Dismiss trends, follow what speaks to you and what makes you feel at home. I, I came across an article recently about uh, how HGTV, um, and I'm not necessarily blaming HGTV, but because if people tune in, they're going to create shows that people want to watch. But this idea that everyone has the same home, the same everything, and nothing's personalized, nothing's yours. It's like everyone else's. And it does take time to figure out what you want, what you love, what makes you feel at home. And then once you find or know that, then it takes time to find what you want and also save up for it if it's going to cost some money. 
but this is the thing. This is your home. This is where you're going to feel rejuvenated and rested and want to, you know, come to for solace or celebration. And you don't want to compromise on that. You want to design a space that you will be happier in, more content in, for far longer than a trend could ever last. Now, with that said, trends happen for a reason. Um, something catches fire. Something catches, uh, piques people's interest. Well, take note of that. It's very much like style and, and clothing and fashion in that regard. So maybe there's a new take on that classic white button-up shirt. Maybe there's a new take on a particular color or hue. And that color works really well for you. That cut works very well for you. That's where knowing your style, knowing what makes you feel comfortable, knowing your home, knowing where you live, knowing how you live makes a big difference. So, and that's also why, um, if there is a particular, um, design approach. So I, like I said, mentioned earlier, William Morris's arts and craft movement, arts and crafts movement really speaks to me. I love that they focus entirely on artisan uh, works that take time that are not mass produced or industrially produced, um, in mass quantity. I love the beauty and the structures and the uh, attention to flora and fauna, but also with a, a, an eye to symmetry, but loose symmetry, all of that spoke to me, partly because of the history, but also partly just because aesthetically it really pleases my eye. And that trend is not a trend. It's been around since the mid 1800s. So it's not going out of style doesn't mean I'm doing everything in arts and crafts, but it guides my decision making. So if you really like, for example, mid-century modern, let that guide you. There are elements of that here in Bend in the homes, but when you go overboard, it that's when it becomes being married to a trend that will be dated eventually. And you'll ask yourself, why did I choose that color, that tile, that piece of furniture? I was just following. I wasn't thinking for myself. So that's why also have patience. Ask yourself, why am I drawn to this? Um, that's, that's key. And you'll also save yourself money in the long run. Um, it's cost per wear. You're going to have these items for far longer, um, even though it might feel a weighty, a weighty expense in the beginning. It'll, it'll pay off down the road. Uh, number six, speaking of investing, invest in the sofa with regards to how it's made. However many you have in your house, I have a small house, so I just have one. And also the fabric you choose. I highly recommend customizing the fabric, whether the company has the options available immediately for you, or you go purchase your own fabric and have someone recover a really good sofa you already have. Um, it's worth investing in your sofa. It plays such a huge role in your main or one of the main living rooms. And if you have it for a long time and it's well made, all you'll have to do is replace the, the fabric um, instead of buy a whole new structure of sofa. Um, and then with regards to chairs... Again, if you've purchased high quality or you've been given high quality chairs or found high quality chairs in vintage shops or consignment shops, just replace the fabric so that it's what you want and it fits your decor. Number seven, know how you live best in your house. This is why patience is key. I didn't know, for example, the last room that I'm going to show on the blog this summer, not the last room, but the last big project I've really invested in this last six months is the front entryway. Um, I'm redoing the doorknob on the front door. I'm adding a screen door, a wooden screen door, and just all the little details in that room and the curtains in that room too. And three years ago, I did not even consider adding a screen door to the front of the house. But the more I lived in this house, the more I realized that's a very dark corner on the east side of the house in the mornings. It's like a little cave. The foyer is like a little cave. But as soon as I open up that front door, all that morning light comes in. How can I make this op an option available to me in the morning? It really lifts my mood. So notice I'm paying attention to the light. 
time paying attention to how it makes the room feel, but also how it makes me feel. And so this last um, winter, I said, okay, I'm going to figure out where to get a screen door that I love that'll be very arts and crafts um, that would work with my house. And so it's been a, I put my order in in April and I just picked up the door two weeks ago, stained it last week and installed it, had a friend help me install it this week or last week, I should say. He's actually finishing the installation today. There's a few little things he wanted to tweak, but I wouldn't have known that I wanted to do that had I not lived in the house for a while. So, so have patience with yourself and know that you, that the ideas will come to you. You'll start to figure it out as, as you live in the house. Okay. Um, number eight, last item in the making the best decisions for you is to choose. So if you're stuck on what color combinations, what do you, which ones do I choose? How do I know? Choose color combinations that work well together in mother nature naturally. And when it comes to each room, so for example, I have an open plan main living space. So my living room goes into my dining room, goes into my kitchen and leads into the boot and basket room. That's a little more narrow entryway, but you, you still see into it. So Basically, four rooms are my five if you consider that the fireplace area is part of the open space, which it absolutely is. So five, technically five rooms. So I had to make all those rooms work together aesthetically. And it did seem a bit overwhelming. <laughs> but then I said, and I did take a class, and I highly recommend taking uh, this class on Create Academy, is Rita Koenig, K-O-N-I-G's. Uh, she was one of the first classes they offered. It is fantastic. Um, taking her, I took her to core class online during the 2020 and I learned so much stick to color combinations that work well with mother nature. Here's what I did. The ocean, the beach colors that I see there, obviously blue for water. Sand is a bit beige, you know, so tonally browns, light browns though, light browns, beige, tan. And then you have the green seagrass. And then you have the sunshine. So I was working with yellow, green, blue, and soft beige or tan. Not dark, not dark, very light. And if you walk into my home, the first thing, I have grass cloth in my foyer, which is a tonal brown, light brown. And again, I'll give a tour of my foyer, detail it, because I added a few things since the original redo when I did the grass cloth. But there is currently a, a, a post about the grass cloth application in that room as it was done two years ago. I've now up, updated it, and that post will be going live in two weeks. That will also include the screen door, so the in, exterior and interior of the foyer in the entryway. So you walk in, you have that. You have a touch of blue in the tweed curtains. And then you see down through immediately to the kitchen, but that's the last room almost. And there's blue and white, blue and white. But the living room, green guided me. I have some blue there in the sofa. And then in my dining room, which is right behind my living room, I have a solid provincial blue curtain for the curtains in the dining room that work well with the sofa that's next to it, which is a small print blue. So the soft or so the small print doesn't compete, but complements those blue curtains. And both of those, because they're in line shot of the stove, work together. And then in the curtains in the kitchen, they are a tweed print as well. And there's blue, a little green, a little bit of brown and tan. And the fireplace has yellow print chairs. So each one has a main color, the green and a little bit of blue in the living room, blue dining room. The kitchen is all about that blue stove with prints in the curtain that pick up everything. The fireplace is all about the yellow. And then if you look all the way back to the end in the boot and basket room, it is that taupe that picks up the gray in the wall that's been painted throughout the rest of the house and yellow and green. That's it. So I really stay in that family of four colors and then they all work together. The key is to have the hue. So the tone has to be the same, cool, warm, make sure the tone is the same. But anyway, that'll help reduce the amount of decisions you have to make and you'll feel less overwhelming. Hopefully that helps with regards to making the decisions that are best for you in the room you're doing or the house you're redoing. Now, before we get into the next section, which is all about how to work with contractors, interior designers, and all those other experts, I have two sponsors I'd like to introduce you to. Some 
summer is better with Bombas. Their thoughtfully designed clothes make you feel effortlessly at ease with breezy, tagless tees to second skin, soft underwear to perfectly cushioned, sweat-wicking socks. As the weather gets warmer, Bombas is inviting you to get outside and find your outer piece in socks, underwear, and t-shirts you can effortlessly move and relax in all season long. Bombas makes clothing designed for warm weather from soft, breezy layers you can move in to socks that wick sweat and cushion every step. They make thoughtfully designed better basics that keep you feeling your best all season long, whether it's on the trail, at the park, or in your own backyard. And every item is seamless, tagless, and effortlessly soft. Bombas are the clothes you'll want to get dressed and move in every day. Now, I love their socks. I have so many Bombas socks, and I wear the lightweight ones during the summer, so they're not that thick, that are no-show socks. And I also wear their mid-calf socks throughout the year. If, For example, if I am going skiing in the winter, but in the summer, I always have their socks on um, for our hikes outside, and they, they go the distance, and they have been with me for years. I highly recommend Bombas for socks that will be with you for a very long time and do exactly what you want, keep you comfortable and allow you to get out and play. Bombas 100% happiness guarantee means you're covered for life. Reach out anytime to their happiness team for easy returns, exchanges, or replacements. So far, Bombas has donated over 100 million items and each purchase adds to that impact. So as a simple sophisticate listener, you can go to bombas.com slash sophisticate and when you use the code SOPHISTICATE, save 20% off your first purchase. That's Bombas, B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash SOPHISTICATE and use code SOPHISTICATE at checkout. That's Bombas dot com slash SOPHISTICATE, code SOPHISTICATE. The Simple Sophisticate is also sponsored by Honey Love Shapewear. So shapewear is a helpful undergarment tool to help your clothing look streamlined and silhouette and to make you feel comfortable in your clothing that makes you look your best. And so when we're talking about shapewear, Honey Love's best-selling superpower short is the go-to. It has targeted compression technology that distinguishes between areas where you want more support and areas you need less compression. Their signature X targets and sculpts your midsection without squeezing your natural curves. It's designed to work with your body, not against it. The Superpower Short is helping ladies everywhere sculpt and smooth from stomach to thigh by offering just the perfect amount of compression. You won't have to worry about it rolling down, which is unheard of in shapewear, thanks to flexible boning that's hidden in the side seams. They also have body suits with 360-degree bonded compression that smooths your tummy and hips, built-in bust support that lifts without an underwire as well. Shapewear that's comfortable. Yep. That's right. But it doesn't stop there. Honey Love has more than just sculpt wear. They have incredibly comfortable bras, tanks, and leggings for everyday support. And ladies, Honey Love is just as easy to put on as it is to take off. Shapewear should not be hard. Their products make you look good and feel good, whether it's for a wedding, an event, or an everyday boost of confidence. Honey Love is your plus one to the summer's events of the season. As a simple, sophisticated listener, treat yourself to the best shapewear on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com slash simplified. Again, that's honeylove, H-O-N-E-Y-L-O-V-E dot com slash simplified to save 20% off Honey Love. Welcome back. Let's get right into our next list of items for how to work well with contractors, interior designers, and anyone else that you're looking to for their expertise. So moving on to the second section, how to work with contractors or to work with anybody else besides yourself that's an expert that you're paying to do something you cannot do. So interior designers, contractors, subcontractors. Okay, I'm going to repeat myself here, but you're not going to be surprised. Number nine, patience is also key when working with your many subcontractors, experts, and contractor. No surprise here for anyone who's done uh, who's done remodeling work. 
as much as you want a timeline, it's going to be really, really hard. If you're doing an extensive remodel, it's going to be really hard to have a specific timeline. The key, though, to keeping it moving is going to be you and clear communication, starting with knowing what you want and also being brave enough, as I'll share in a minute, um, to speak up. So let's just keep this one in the back of our mind. Patience is also key in this journey. Ten. Now, if you've ever worked with a contractor, the main contractor, um, you pay him uh, a certain hourly wage for his work. But then on top of all the project, whatever it costs him to pay, because if he's hiring the subcontractors or she's hiring the subcontractors, um, they're going to pay them. But then on top of the total bill they take, um, they will also then charge either between 10 to 17 percent. I think my contract, if I remember correctly, was 14 to 15 percent. Um And then he had his hourly wage. So this is why number 10 is so important. Buy as many of the items directly. So maybe it's your stove, your bathtub, the fixtures, whatever it is that you can buy directly. You need to do that. It'll save you money because you're not paying 15. I'm just going to say 15, but whatever the contract percentage is on top of that. So whatever you're not putting on his bill to pay for directly himself or herself, it's important to do that. You'll save yourself money. So I, I did do that. I bought the stove directly. I bought all the fixtures and the bathtubs and the the tile. I bought all of that directly. So he wasn't going to be making money on that. Now he actually, it did encourage me to do that, to try to save me money. So I appreciated his honesty and his awareness of budgeting. But just so you know, it's a pretty basic one, but just in case you didn't know, um, they will, if they're going to have to manage it, they're going to have you pay for that percentage on top of it. Um, number 11, make sure. So say you've ordered these items, uh, make sure every item, if there's a multiple parts to it, that you ordered is there upon arrival. So for example, um, for my guest bathroom, all the fixtures arrived from my clawfoot tub um, or supposedly all arrived from my clawfoot tub and I went through them. Actually, I shouldn't say that. I didn't go through them immediately. This is where I learned the lesson. On the day they were going to be installed, the plumber had arrived. And this is the other thing. Subcontractors can be hard to pin down. So you want everything ready to go when they get there. So you don't have to reschedule them. There was a part missing. And I was so frustrated, but I should have been frustrated at myself because I should have checked it immediately upon arrival. And then I reached out to Rejuvenation. I said, hey, this is missing. Can you get it to me? Of course, it took another couple of weeks to get it. And I just, I knew it was my fault. So check everything as soon as it arrives, make sure you have, and then if you don't know, have your contractor look through it with you. And that was my contractor looked at it. He's like, no, Shannon, everything's not here. Where's this? Where's that? We need to get those things. So that's going to help you speed up the process so that when that plumber arrives, when that Tyler arrives, you have everything they need. 12, um, when you're beginning the journey with your contractor or your interior designer, whoever you're working with, have pictures of exactly what you're thinking. So many times during my journey with Le Papillon, I had ideas they had never done before. My contractor or my Tyler had never done before. Um, So what I did in my sink and my primary bathroom, they had never used tile like that before. And mine were raindrops or what I call raindrops. Some people call them fish scales. (laughs) But the design I was thinking was something they hadn't done. The placement of my sinks and the faucet were things that they had never done before. Some of the fixtures that I customized, for example, the front door, doorknob, the gentleman had you know, the customized pieces are so hard to work with. He told me, I was like, well, I'm not going to (laughs) change what I order. That's what I want and what fits in my door. So a lot of the times, as much as you might think that they have worked with exactly what you've done before, they may not have. And so being very clear, very specific, showing them, walking them through them, confirming they understand is so important. So you have to do it again. So you have to reorder the different items again to get it right. So, yeah. For example, just with my sinks and my bathrooms, both my guest and my primary bath, I put the faucet askew. It's askew on the left side for both of my bathrooms, not immediately in the middle of the sink. And I have reasons for that. And then I walk through you, walk through my reasons in those posts. But that was very intentional. And I remember my plumber and contractor going, oh, that's interesting. Why'd you do that? I've never seen that. And then I explain it to them. And of course, it doesn't matter the reason, but oh, they're like, oh, that kind of makes sense. And I'm really glad I did that. And it also had to do with the size of my sink, which is oval. All right, so that's number 12. 13, 
Here we go. Get ready to find your voice. You will need it, especially if this is you and you alone making the decisions as it was for me. I found it when the bill was more than I expected. I found it when I was double charged and said, nope, I don't think I'm going to pay for that twice. And they took it off because I actually was a customer who would check my invoices. I found it when I kept pushing and say, where are you? Why aren't you here? You told me this would be done. I mean, I didn't become aggressive. I just refused to play nice. I was a friendly, direct customer. And I know some people liked it and some people didn't, but I was paying for it. So I felt, yes, I have the right to do this. It also came in the form of asking lots of questions. You know, if something doesn't make sense to you, you know, you're a student, so you're learning. I learned so much about so many things. And it's also about um, communicating, uh, getting to know your contractor um, and whatnot. So you might, and make sure you're off the clock when you're talking to them about things that are not project uh, directly related. I, that was a, I quickly would ask that. I was like, am I on the clock right now? We're talking about family. We're talking about this, that, and the other, because I just didn't know. I just didn't know. Ask. Find your voice, stand up for yourself. And I want to just jump into 14 here real quick because it does work with 13. Check each invoice to confirm that that is what you have on there is correct itemization for charges from the retailer. And so that when your contractor gets that invoice, because sometimes, you know, for example, a plumber will come over and charge whatever they charge and then send that bill to your contractor. And then your contractor gets 15% of that payment, right? You're paying 15% on top of that. Um, so one time we had a plumber come during my installation of my stove. So the first year, and he hooked up the gas line, which was, um, a certain amount, not a cheap amount. The next year he returned to work on something for one of my bathrooms. Well, for whatever reason, and I don't know, so I can't say the reason, um, as I was looking for the invoice that he charged my contractor, he charged for a fee again that he had charged for my kitchen gas line hookup. And I said, we weren't hooking up any gas lines for the bathroom. So why is it on here? Well, whether it was genuinely a mistake or not, I will never know. But uh, my contractor said, oh, wow, yeah, that shouldn't be there. Saved me a bunch of money, but they, no one would have caught it unless I looked through it. So look through all the itemized receipts whether they're directly to you or to your contractor to make sure everything is on there that should be and nothing is on there, on there that shouldn't be. But that was a moment I had to find my voice because I went to the plumber directly. He was at the house for another moment for another project. And I said, look, I know we all make mistakes, but I did pay you for this. So um, can you look back at your invoice to make sure this is correct? And he looked at me and he said, I'll take a look. And uh, then he reached out to my contractor and told him, or they worked it out and they took it off. So I didn't get become aggressive, but I did let him know that I see what you did. It's incorrect. Please fix it. That was number 14. And then I've never looked, worked with that plumber again. I will say that. My contractor was a little upset by that as well. 15, again, during the pandemic, a lot of things were a little bit stressful for all sorts of reasons in everyone's lives. So I, I give them, I give them grace for that. 15, be willing to live in your house or visit it every day. If you can't live in your house while it's being remodeled to ensure that there is quality work being done and the correct work is done and that there's work being done, you know, just keep accountability happening and asking questions and I did live in my house the whole time. I know some people don't, cannot, because, you know, they, maybe both bathrooms are ripped out. Um, it's stressful. It's not, it's not for the faint of heart because you're living in a house that's deconstructed. <laughs> um, but for me, and obviously it was pandemic time too, so even if I wanted to, it would have been hard to leave. I found that when I was here, things were at happen. I went away one weekend and my contractor had said he was going to get such and such done. And I remember coming back thinking, what did you do? So that was only one or two times that that happened. But I remember thinking, okay, just stay put. Don't go away. Get it done. And then you can travel. Then you can go away. So that's just something, you know, your stress load with everything else that's going on in your life is also something to weigh. But if uh, you want it done well and swiftly and only done once well and not have to repeat something, it's uh, 
It's a good investment of your time and energy. Number 16, this is about finding the right people to work with. Um, don't take their word at face value. And what I mean by that is say someone, say you know your house really well and you should, but you know, maybe you still have some questions. I had a gentleman come in who was going to work on my HVAC and because the previous company had gone out of business, they were no longer working. And so I was trying to find someone new and I knew my house very well. And he said a few things that I said, this doesn't, this is inaccurate. He either doesn't know what he's doing or he's trying to pull it over on me. And so I kindly said, thank you for your information. And I'll reach out if I want to continue to work with you. And I don't, and I didn't. And I found someone that I really respected and who did a great job and who did know what was going on. So be prepared to say, this doesn't feel right to yourself and in your Way, way with integrity, um, show them the door. Um, it might cost you a, a few pennies to have to go through two people or three people to find who you want, but at least they won't do work on your house that isn't correct or cost you more than is necessary. And that's number 16. 17, just to repeat, keep checking in. You know, if something was supposed to come in and it's taking time, keep calling the retailer. How's my order coming? What's going on with that? Do you have an, and you have an estimated delivery day or whatever it might be. I mean, I was, I was a dog chasing a bone on so many projects. I'm sure people got sick and tired of me. The tile company, the, the plumbing company, the uh, rejuvenation. I became uh, a first name basis with some of the people w waiting on different products. And again, this is during the pandemic. So a lot of things were delayed, but I needed to, to make sure for my peace of mind that things were still rolling forward. And I also needed to know that my small order, which most of my orders were very small, wasn't slipping through the cracks with other big orders that they were dealing with. So just keep checking in, whether email or phone, just keep checking in. This is your project. This is your home. This is your money. Um, do so um, in, in, in a calm and respectful way, but a direct, but a direct way. So number 17, is just keep checking in. 18, and this is for, I don't want to be, I need to be thoughtful in how I want to talk about this, but I think it's very important to be aware that this might happen so you're prepared. Uh, and you're going to deal with people in your own way that you feel comfortable. But I really had to grow a little bit in this area to acknowledge that I, in some instances, was being spoken to differently than if I had been a man because I would see it directly in my house when they would speak to a man versus me. There might be some mansplaining that will happen to you. Assumptions that you don't know how certain things work. And you might not know how some things work, and that's okay. But just know that if you do know, don't let them make you think that you don't. And keep asking questions until you do. Now, most of the contractors, subcontractors I worked with were wonderful, but I've worked with, I worked with a lot. And so there were a few that it was very uncomfortable to work with them. And I either just got through it or told my contractor, no, I don't want to work with that subcontractor again. Um, but at the same time, don't let someone tell you what you know after having done your homework or you know it's right for what you want in your house, that that's the way it's going to be. Um, do so with grace, but with strength. It's hard, but every time you do it, it will get be easier and you will always sleep better at night knowing that you honored your intuition. And even if your intuition says this doesn't feel right, this doesn't sound right, just keep asking questions until you decide you know what to do. I think that's so important. That's so important. Uh, I've been speaking with a few of my neighbors recently who are in the middle of, of reconstruction in their houses, and I, I, uh, we, I empathize with them, but at the same time, I'm both, we're both excited because um, we know what's coming, and I know what's coming, and is stressful and is mentally exhausting, and uh, as unpredictable at moments this journey was, I wouldn't change it. I, I'm glad it's done, but I'm glad the results are what they are. I'm so tickled with and feel so fortunate to have these projects completed. So think of it whenever there's a hiccup that comes up or a moment that makes you feel uncomfortable. 
that pushes you to do something maybe outside your comfort zone, think of it as an opportunity to grow. Um, even if you, you know, want to reach out to someone and go, okay, what do I do? You know, right there, you're growing, you're reaching out, you're gathering more information. Um, there's so much opportunity for growth <laughs> during this journey. Oh my goodness. So that's the second section, how to work with others, designers, contractors, subcontractors. Now I have two more sections of ideas and, and lessons learned, but first I have two more sponsors to share with you. Let's get into those. Have you ever wondered why laundry detergent comes in massive plastic jugs? Who wants that? 91% of those inconvenient, awkward, heavy jugs end up in landfills and oceans, harming our planet and marine life. There has to be a better way. And it's not like you can just stop doing laundry. So do what I did. And I sincerely did. I switched to EarthBreeze. My new EarthBreeze laundry detergent eco sheets look like dryer sheets, but they're not. It's a revolutionary liquidless laundry detergent that dissolves 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold. No measuring, no mess, and no heavy plastic jugs. Just toss the sheet in. EarthBreeze has really made the whole concept of detergent better. The packaging is lightweight. It's like a small little package of paper, so it fits anywhere in your cupboard or drawer. It's biodegradable and plastic-free, and it's great for all laundry lifestyles, even sensitive skin. Their eco sheets are hypoallergenic and dermatologist tested. EarthBreeze is compatible with high efficiency washers, gray water systems, and is septic safe. They offer flexible subscriptions that can be adjusted, paused, or canceled by you at any time. No contracts or fees. And they're delivered right to your door, to your mailbox via free carbon neutral shipping at a frequency you can set that works for your unique lifestyle. And most importantly, you get a powerful clean. Earth Breeze is tough on stains, fights odors, and your clothes come out clean every single time. So I have, the last this last spring, I switched. I no longer buy jugs. I have put myself into a subscription of about, I think it's, I have a package of 50 sheets delivered every two and a half to three months. I was just doing laundry this morning my replacement or my new subscription will, or my new delivery will arrive here in middle August. And I have more than enough to get me to what I need. Sometimes if I have a small load, I rip the sheet in half because they're about six inches by four inches because I just don't need as much detergent. And you can easily do that. I tell you, this has changed the budget for laundry detergent, changed how much space I need to save these. And it makes me feel better that knowing that I'm helping the planet a little bit. I highly recommend them. I can, and they're really inexpensive. I paid $12 for each uh, delivery. Absolutely uh, affordable and worthwhile. But don't just take my word for it. You can try for yourself with their risk-free 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't like it, EarthBreeze will give you a full refund. No questions asked and no return necessary. So as a simple, sophisticated listener, switch from the old-fashioned goo to something new. Right now, listeners of the Simple Sophisticated podcast can subscribe to EarthBreeze and save 40%. That's right, 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash sophisticate to get started. That's Earth. E-A-R-T-H, Breeze, B-R-E-E-Z-E dot com slash sophisticate for 40% off. Earthbreeze.com slash sophisticate. The Simple Sophisticate is also sponsored by Hello. Have you ever tried a buckwheat pillow? They're totally different than the fluffy soft pillows most of us are used to. And they sent me one to try. And what a wonderful, supportive, breathable pillow this is. It supports your head and neck how you want it to, unlike traditional squishy soft pillows which collapse under the weight of your head. Soft pillows allow your neck to fall into a downward bend, adding uncomfortable pressure to muscles, nerves, and discs. And even better, hollow stays cool and dry compared to pillows filled with feather or foam. Most pillows absorb and retain body heat and moisture, making your pillow feel warm and humid. But buckwheat tends to breathe better. No more flipping to the cool side of the pillow. Here's a test to determine if indeed your pillow is or isn't working for you. 
do you use to pillows or fold your pillow in an attempt for proper support? This is a sign that your pillow isn't firm or thick enough. Hello support allows you to keep your head and neck where you want them. You can add or remove fill from the zippered opening. So simple. This gives you the ability to adjust the pillow's thickness to your liking. It also allows you to remove the fill so you can wash the case. People have been sleeping on buckwheat pillows for centuries. They have been used in Japan extensively and remain relatively popular to this day. In fact, you might even see them on the pillow menu at fancy hotels. And buckwheat is a more natural way to sleep. What are you laying your head on every night? Perhaps it's a sack of plucked bird feathers or a petroleum-based foam. Hullo is made in the USA with quality construction and materials. The certified organic cotton case is cut and sewn for durability, and the Buckwheat is grown and milled in the U.S. So here's the deal. Sleep on it for 60 nights. If Hello isn't for you, just ship it back and they'll give you a refund. Go to hellopillow.com slash simple sophisticate. That's H-U-L-L-O-P-I-L-L-O-W dot com slash simple sophisticate. If you try more than one pillow, you get a discount of up to $20 per pillow, depending upon the size. Get fast, free shipping on every order, and 1% of all profits are donated to the Natural Conservancy. Give the gift of better sleep. Hello is a unique gift your friends and family will appreciate every night. Um, the last one is how you can kind of, you know, do some of these things on your own or save yourself some money because you're going to do them on your own because you will know how to do them well. Um, and I'll give you some examples. So skills that give you options. Okay. So this one could have been in the first section, but I want to talk about working with prints. Um, uh, you know, I, I always, have been, I always gravitate toward an English country cottage home or a country home and all the different use of fabrics and prints together. And, and you think that they won't work, but somehow they do. And so I've been trying to become a student of that. And it's absolutely possible. And it's something I actually did speak about in the, my conversation with Anita Joyce in Decorating Tips and Tricks. The key thing, and I have a lot of prints, wallpaper and fabrics in my house. The key thing is to first understand the hue, so cool or warm, and then decide you're going to have a big print, a small print, and if you're going to have solids, make sure you have some texture. So, for example, in my um, living room, I have a chair with an ottoman, a matching ottoman. That's a big, beautiful Schumacher print of florals. And the background of this print is a light, light gray. I have um, what I call taupe walls, but it's an element of gray. And so it's the same tone as the background of my print in my chair that it sits next to. But the print is big, it's floral, has green and blues. And it's, it's, it's embroidered, so there's texture to it. So that chair is the star fabric. And then the wall behind it is solid. And then I have my striped chair next to it, but that striped chair, while yes, it's the star, as I mentioned earlier, it's also not competing. It's a stripe. It's not a floral. So they're not, there's not two stripes sitting next, or there's not two florals sitting next to each other. There's not two stripes sitting next to each other. They're their own entities. But tonally, the green stripe in the chair picks up the subtle green in the print of the floral. And they work together. But then the wall and the curtain are solid colors that pick up on the colors in those prints. And then the sofa in this room is a small print. It's not going to compete with these chairs that one has a floral print that's large and a solid uh, stripe print. So I went with a very small, delicate print of blue and white for my sofa. And then I put on the pillows, I put big prints and a lot of texture. So there's some corduroy on there. There's big stripes on there. There's a print of birds from cabbage and curtain rail. There's a solid uh, velvet uh, for winter. But I have bigger prints and f bolder textures on the sofa that has very subtle, delicate, small print. And they're all the same tones. It's all different shades of blue um, and touches of that sand or tan. 
the key so those are the three things a large print a small print and keep them all in the same hue not necessarily all blue or all green but pick up on if there's little in the print there's little different colors there pick them up with a solid pillow that picks up that small print in the other other pillow or in the chair have fun with that because a print actually lets the eye keep traveling and it seems weird, it's odd, but a solid wall, a solid colored sofa or chair stops the eye. And if you're trying to make the room look bigger, or if you're trying to let the eye keep flowing through a space, choose a print. And that is a powerful illusion that tricks the eye. Similarly, in my boot and basket room, I wallpapered, as I mentioned, it's the last room in the house, the last thing you see. But because my house is small, I didn't want to just stop the eye. I wanted it to feel more expansive. And so that print actually in a very small room, that's why prints are so powerful in small rooms on wallpaper. They make the room appear bigger because it doesn't stop the eye. You don't feel like you're in a cave. So think about um, learning how to work with prints and using them because it really gives signature style to a space. Um, and who t taught me a lot about this, and I'm still learning, is again, Rita Koenig's course on decor. Highly recommend it. She talks about prints a lot and how to work with them. Um, number 20, this is a fun one to always think about. And think about this just when you're going into another home or, or, or a boutique or a museum. Uh, you want to lead the eye from the room you're in into the next room by creating interest visually. So I mentioned that when you walk into my house, you don't first see the living room, even though the living room is the first room. You first see the stove, which is three rooms back, technically. And you see the copper pan sitting above the stove and the hood. It just immediately catches your eye that's going to draw me forward. That's going to welcome me into the house. What else is going to keep me moving? As I walk toward the stove, I see the boot and basket room and I keep moving toward that because that wallpaper, it's happy, it's light, it's simple, but it's bold at the same time, interestingly enough. I turn to my I turn to my right and I'm looking at my primary bedroom and I see my tulip chair that I've covered in a Schumacher print, blue print, and you're pulled into that room. If I'm sitting on the sofa in the living room, I'm looking into my office and I have my snug and I have a tour of that room as well, the office tour. And you see my big, huge uh, wing back chair with a table and a light and it's inviting you to come in and get cozy. So whichever the room is that you're trying to draw people into, stand outside of the room and see what, what is framed in the door frame. Put something there. Could be furniture, could be a, uh, a piece of art, could be the window. Create a space or create a vignette that draws people into that room. They'll be glad you did. And it's fun for you as you live in the space because you can change that vignette as the seasons change, as you change, things like that. All right, 20, uh, 21, details matter, tend to them as you can afford. Now, in an earlier uh, post, I wrote in great detail, no pun intended, on doing just that. Those little details, the doorknobs, the, 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 the uh, drawer pulls. Um, for example, in my bathroom, I chose door, uh, drawer pulls that are flush with the cabinet so they don't get hooked on any of the cords for my blow dryer or my curling iron. Um, those little details that look good but also function really, really well as you can afford them, do them. I'm swapping out gradually all my light switches <laughs> from the plastic ones to brass ones. And each room, each time I get through one, it just looks, makes that room look so much smarter and pops it. I love it. Um, number 22, shop consignment and be prepared to barter. Talking about finding your voice. Here we go. Whether it's finding your voice and bartering just by making a, a negotiated offer on the online with first dibs or, or, or cherish, um, do it. Uh, you might not get what you want, but you at least know what you want. And that's a big first step. So many, uh, so many of my items in my home, especially my office are consignment my desk, my two, my chair, uh, two of my side tables, uh, so many. Um, in my living room, the tea tables, both my tea tables in my living room are, are consignment. Um, I, I love shopping consignment. I, my, my cookbook holder in my kitchen, which I love, that came from Provence. It was on first dibs consignment. Uh, bartered on it and got it during the pandemic. So tickled. Um, 
have fun. You might do this when you're traveling and you go to a brocante or a flea market or a fair. Um, have fun finding those treasures and then don't be afraid to barter. They might say no. Okay. Do you love it enough to buy it at full price? You might pick it up. That's okay too, but it's worth trying. Number 23, um, I want to talk about window treatments for a minute. And I've talked about them before, but I've learned something just recently. So as I mentioned, Veronique worked with me on all of the curtains in my home, except I just put in three Roman shades, one Roman shade in my entry, my foyer, and two in my kitchen. And those were not done with Veronique because she doesn't work with uh, Roman shades. But I knew that's what I wanted. So as I was finishing up my curtain projects, <laughs> I had to do this one on my own. And I had learned so much from her and I learned of so many of the brands that I would want to shop on or shop shop for these particular prints that I felt comfortable doing this on my own and finding someone. Um, I found someone who made Roman shades through uh, a trusted designer, um, Michaela Corey, who is the owner and creator of Cabbage and Curtain Rail in England. And I asked her, who does she know that makes Roman shades? And she recommended this one woman show in, in England. And um, Beth did an amazing job. Beth Studholm did an amazing job on my curtains, my, my Roman shades. And I'll give you a tour again of the, the Roman shades in the foyer at the end of this month. And then I'm going to do a brand new kitchen model, a kitchen tour this fall because I've added some curtains. I've added some decor to the kitchen. And I just want to show you what it looks like now. And that will include the two Roman shades. Um, but anyway, what I learned is you don't need an interior designer if you know what you want and you know a trusted seamstress that can make the curtains you need. This will save you money. And for many of you, you already know why. So when I went to go buy the fabric for my curtains on my own, not through Veronique, I saved a ton. Understandably, if Veronique is doing the shopping for me, she's going to get She's going to mark up the fabric. That's part of the business, her expertise. You're paying for that. And I needed her expertise, but now I can do it on my own. So I purchased the fabric, sent it to my seamstress who worked directly with me, and I saved easily 70%. So, you know, go to your interior designer for your first project or someone that is in that industry, learn from them, figure out the fabrics, figure out the terminology of the curtain style you want. But then if you do find a seamstress that's not connected to your interior designer, understandably, um, there's that, you don't want to, dis to be disrespectful. Um, and by no, and like I said, Veronique didn't work with Roman shades. So this was, she knew I was doing this, but it just saves you so much money. Um, but customized curtains to fit your home. If you're going to live there for more than five years, I highly recommend you do it. Um, it just completely changes and elevates the room. Um, I didn't imagine myself redoing or adding so many curtains um, in, the, in such a short amount of time, but uh, I wanted to utilize her expertise and I knew immediately each time I added curtains that I love the room. And so I was like, okay, let's get this done. So the only room in my house that isn't, doesn't have window curtains that I don't want on them, um, or, you know, that I would eventually put something on and will in the future is my guest room. I've actually left the curtains, the, the windows blank in my boot and basket room, um, because I just love the light in there. And I love how much spaciousness the big wide open curtains give it. Okay. That's enough about curtains. Let's talk about something else. Number 24. Just because you haven't done something before doesn't mean you cannot teach yourself to do it. Okay, you are going to become someone who can do more than you realize. I am not someone who likes to do it by myself or do DIY. I, 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 if I can have someone do it better than me, I'm going to have them do it. It's worth paying them for that. But for example, I know how to put in a brand new light. I can remove an old light fixture, whether if it's semi-flush, flush, chandelier, as long as I can hold it on my own muscle-wise, I can, I know how to connect it so it properly works. And I did that above my uh, island in my kitchen, the three pennant lightings um, on the slanted ceiling. That took some time, but I did that and it saved me time uh, from having to wait for someone to come. I've also now learned how to install a door handle. <laughs> 
um, that has a deadbolt. And uh, that's going to save me money when uh, I install that. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, there are obviously so many things I could not have done by myself. And so I would reach out for other people to do that. Um, case in point, I, I can put curtain rods up above a window, but I didn't want to ruin my wallpaper. And I wanted to make sure it was in a stud and it was held properly, the rod, so that my curtains hung the way I wanted them to. So I made sure I hired someone to help me put those up. So find the things you can do that you can do well, um, or you can teach yourself to do well and have fun learning, um, that you're far more capable than you might've have, might have realized. And number 25, I've mentioned wallpaper a little bit already, but I want to mention it a little bit more. Wallpaper is so powerful and it immediately adds a signature to a room. So I'm going to dare you to do it. Start in a small room. First of all, my house as I mentioned, the main living areas are all open plants. I don't have, I do not have any wallpaper in the main areas. It's all the same gray or taupe wall paint that came with the house. Ceiling and everything is the same color. And it actually provides a unification of all those rooms. That's what actually unifies it all. Um, and then all the prints come in the fabrics and in the curtains if I have, have them in the curtains. But it's only in my small rooms, the boot and basket room, primary bedroom, primary bathroom, guest bathroom, an office, and foyer that have wallpaper. So small rooms, because again, if it's a print wallpaper, it makes it look even bigger. And depending on the wallpaper you choose, it can bring light, it can add light, it can create coziness. And there's so many different options out there. It's so much fun to go shopping for the print that you want. Just invest in quality wallpaper and it makes it much easier to put up. It won't tear on you. <laughs> I highly recommend that. Uh, but do start in a small bathroom first to gather your nerve. And then uh, I think you'll find that you want to keep doing some more. All right. So I was mistaken. I have a fourth category because, of course, I have 33 things I wanted to share with you. And the final category is what makes Le Papillon feel like my forever home. Okay. And again, these are ideas that might uh, speak to you with regards to um, making decisions as you go about this journey. Number 26, don't ask others to approve of what you are deciding on. I did not ask anybody whether or not I should get a blue stove. That was in my head, going to happen, just have to find it. Instead, Look to those who understand design and ask how something works, why it works, then begin making decisions with this gained wisdom. In other words, you may not know why you like a particular room. So say you have a picture of something. And if you're trying to understand it, ask that interior designer, ask the contractor. If the contractor it has expertise in that area. Sometimes they don't, and they, they should be confident enough to tell you that. They're clearly a, an expert in many other things. Um, my contractor helped me decide many decisions with regards to placement of utensils in my kitchen. Uh, I remember him pointing out, he's like, well, are you right-handed or left-handed? Well, then you might want to put these items on your right side and put those on your left side. Um, but he doesn't know, didn't know everything about what I was thinking. So Make sure if you're not sure why something works, ask somebody who knows. Um, and it could be someone uh, online too. reach out to an interior designer you respect and ask them a question. Um, but again, you if you're going to live in the house, so it's you on your own or you and your partner or whoever's making the decisions and because they're living there. It's not about getting other people's approval. It's not even asking the real estate market what they would be selling. no. I think we've become fallen into that trap in America too much and we're creating homes for someone else, not for ourselves. And thus we're giving up the opportunity to create a, a very nurturing sanctuary when we design it with the approval of others in mind. So seek first your own approval. <laughs> Good life advice there too. Number 27, prioritize the entries of your room, of your home. And what I mean by entries are the front entryway, maybe your porch, uh, your foyer, um, and interior and exterior. And if you enter your home in a, from a different way, maybe you enter through the garage or the back door, don't forget that entryway as well. My very first project was the boot and basket room in January, 2020. And I chose to do that room first because I come through the garage door into that room first every single day, multiple times a day sometimes. And I wanted to feel welcomed. 
I said, what do I need? And that's why I started there. And then quickly after that, I did the foyer. I grass clothed the foyer. I changed the light fixture, put down a rug. Uh, I didn't finish it entirely because the curtains weren't done until this year. But the idea is you're setting a tone. It's, it's the, the first sentence in a great book, right? And do you want to keep reading? Do you feel welcomed? And most importantly, it's again, do you feel welcomed? And then you can start to play with it. If it's your front entry, okay, I feel welcomed. Would my guests feel welcomed here? And try to marry the two. But prioritize those points. Don't forget about them. 28, acknowledge where you spend most of your time and start there. That's why I began with my kitchen. The first thing I did when I bought my home is, okay, I told my dad, I said, I need a contractor, dad, I have to swap out this stove. This stove will not work because of my cooking show, because of the blog, because I find comfort in my kitchen. I'm in here all the time, three times a day, if not more. And that's where we started. I get, as I said, the stove was the very first purchase. Not everyone lives in their kitchen like I do. So don't start there. Do you work from home? Start there. I think all of us could start in our primary bedroom because we all sleep there. <laughs> so think about that. If you're wondering, where do I start? It's too overwhelming. Well, where do you spend most of your time that might help guide your decision? 29, let the light in. And by light, I mean natural light. However, you can let in natural light, do it. When you're putting up window treatments, make sure they're available to you to open up and let the light in. Um, even if you're using voile or, or sheer curtains, that lets light in. Um, in my living room, I have voile behind the silk curtains, and I very rarely will pull the voile curtains because it's so dark there, even at night. But the voile creates privacy, but it still lets me know when it's morning and the light just glows through those curtains. So think about that as well. And try, if you're designing the house, put as many windows, high quality in as you can, um, especially on the north side. That's one thing my house uh, doesn't have a lot of windows on the north side, partly because of where it's placed. And I have neighbors behind me, so that's okay. I get it. But um, the more light you get in that north side, the less dark your home will feel. Uh, for those of us who live in the northern hemisphere. Vice versa, if you live in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, number 30, create multiple snug areas throughout the home. Include the outside as well. So back in June, I shared the detailed post of my office and the snug that I created in my office. And I wrote or shared eight ideas for how to create a snug. And I'll include that in the show notes so you can read that post. Um, but if you're like me, and I think there's many of you out there in this community that are very similar, um, you love to just settle in and just be, whether it's reading, whether it's doing a puzzle, whether it's relaxing, taking a nap, whatever it might be, chatting, snuggling with your pup, sipping a cuppa and watching the birds outside, the snow, the rain, whatever, creating these welcoming places is so important. And they don't really have to cost that much. You can... You know, add a chair, add a light, table lamp, a table, and uh, surround yourself with what you love. But I encourage you to have multiple ones of these, not just one. So I have one in my living room. I call that my reading nook. So there's a big bookshelf beside it. And then I have the other one in my office, which also has a bookshelf beside it. And then I have uh, my front porch, which I, I would definitely consider that a snuggle area. And uh, I think the more you have of them the more welcoming and cozy your home becomes. Another thing, a very simple thing that um, makes this home feel like my forever home, and this is something I've done in all my homes, is to always have fresh flowers, at least one vase or, or bud vase of fresh flowers. Um, it just doesn't feel as cozy as loving without it. And 32, uh, details that make you smile. Add whatever details make you smile. This you know, evolves as you evolve um, and get to know yourself and travel and live. Um, but, you know, I've, I, I talk about this piece often, my, my old copper tea kettle on my stove that I found in Provence. I love it. <laughs> it's, it's battered. It's not uh, perfect, but it makes me smile every time I see it. And it is definitely a detail in the kitchen. Uh, the p framed pictures that I've taken on my travels, um, 
little details, the tile in my fireplace that I'd chosen to represent my past, my present, and my future. Um, those little details that most people walk by will never notice, never notice. Yeah. And last but not least, 33. Okay. Um, this one's going to depend on you and your lifestyle, but tech and clocks have their place, but none of them glaringly obvious or obstructive. That's how I live. I don't have any clocks that are tech, meaning no glowing lights. Um, I have, let's see, one analog clock or face clock. And it's very, very small. Um, in the living room, just so I know if I want to look, I can find it, but it isn't glaring. And then I have one wall clock in my office, um, very minimal, as you'll see in the tour. And then I have a clock, um, a small gray digital clock, not glowing lights um, on my timer in my kitchen. And that's it. And I remember having really big clocks in my other homes. And as soon as I got rid of all that, it really lets me relax in my house. I'm not living by the clock. Um, it sounds like a simple, well, you kind of have to still. Yeah, you do. And I do look, look at my phone every once in a while. But for the most part, it lets me be more present. So that's just something that's helped me live more enjoyably in my house. All right. So, whoa, well, that's a list. 33 items. I hope something spoke to you as you go about your uh, customization of your sanctuary or are thinking about doing so. And you can find the show notes for this entire list and all the links that I mentioned throughout, as well as all the tours of each of the rooms that I mentioned on the show notes, the simplyluxuriouslife.com slash podcast 361. I'll be back with this week's Petit Plaisirs. We have two. Woohoo! <laughs> So this week's Petit Plaisirs are two series, and the first one is one I've been wanting to include as a Petit Plaisir for a couple of years now, and I keep not forgetting, I always mention it in this and that when the new episodes or the new seasons arrive, um, but it deserves to be a Petit Plaisir. Come on. Uh, that was Norman. We're in the closet, like I said, and he was outside of the closet. Now we're all in the closet together. Okay. Um, but anyway, this one is a Danish series, and it is called Seaside Hotel in English. And um, it is set pre-World War II on the North Sea uh, in Denmark, and it follows the what we might call a bed and breakfast, but it's a hotel that is so quintessentially beachside beautiful or seaside beautiful. You have the decor with wallpaper and beadboard and each, each, each guest has their own room on the second floor. And then there is the common eating area for dinner and breakfast. Then there's the salon or the, the, the lounge area where there's a piano and where they can play games and they talk and they drink and have their aperitifs. Um, and of course they go to the ocean often and the style of clothing, um, is quintessential to that time. Very, very thoughtfully chosen by the stylist, beautiful, um, and it, and it chronologically begins with season one, pre-World War Two in the background starting to begin. And you have all these members uh, of the cast that come from different walks of life in Denmark, all different ages, stages of life. They all choose to come here every summer so they know each other. And so it's a reunion of sorts where they catch up on each other's lives. And it's been going now for nine seasons. It is spoken in Danish, so you watch it with subtitles. PBS um, has has hosted or shown some of the seasons um, on their Walter Presents uh, streaming service. Um, I watch mine via Amazon Prime. And now season nine is as World War II has ended, just the aftermath of it. Uh, it is exquisitely done, aesthetically pleasing to the eye. The North Sea is gorgeous. The location of this hotel is stunning. And I have to thank readers that live in Denmark um, who have recommended this series. It has just been a treat every time a new season comes out. 
Um, so if you're looking for uh, international series and the beautiful Danish language, I highly recommend this series called Seaside Hotel. And I'll provide a, a trailer for you to watch because it is in subtitles on the show notes if you would like to check it out. The second uh, petit plaisir that I'm so very, very late to the party on this one. And many, many, many of you have recommended I watch this series. And I finally began doing so just this month. And I can't stop watching. It is Foil's War. Yep, you're nodding your head. Those of you who have already watched it or have watched all the seasons and going, well, duh, Shannon. <laughs> It is created and written by Anthony Horowitz. And this is part of the reason I said, Shannon, you better watch this. Because Anthony Horowitz, if you already uh, know his that name, you know that he created Magpie Murders, created and wrote those books that inspired the series. He created and wrote the, the adaptation of the, of the television series that was airing on PBS last year. And a second season is coming this next fall. Cannot wait. Um but he cre this was his first creation, and he writes and creates this series, Foil's War. And if you read his mystery series, Anthony uh, Horowitz and Hawthorne, you know he creates Foil's War because he mentions that in this series. And I've always enjoyed how he writes a mystery. Now, if you know anything else about Anthony Horowitz, you know he has written many of the episodes of, of Poirot uh, that were appeared um with David Suchet, and he's written many of the episodes of Midsummer Murders. This man can write a good mystery that keeps you guessing. It is never obvious to the eye what's really going on until well in, and even then sometimes I don't know. And that happens in his books, too. He's a wonderful mystery writer, cozy mystery writer. So is it any wonder that Foyle's War is superbly done? It is brilliant in that regard. Cozy mystery set in a southern coastal town in England, starring Michael Kitchen as Detective Chief Superintendent Christopher Foyle. And his driver, because Foyle does not drive, um, his driver is Samantha Stewart, played by Honeysuckle Weeks, um, his son, An Andrew, and then his... Um, and uh, the sergeant that works with Foyle, uh, Paul Milner, is played by Anthony Howell. These are the main characters that keep being repeated um, in the seasons. And there are many, many, many seasons. This series began in 2002 and ran to 2015. So it starts um, in 1939. And so Foyle isn't in the military. His son, Andrew, is a pilot, but he is working as the local police detective. And he's highly respected, and he's fighting his own war on the home front, investigating crime in the south coast of England and, and, and dealing with the black market and profiteering and, and all those things that keep happening even during times of war, maybe more so or in different ways because of war. And it goes through almost almost month by month through World War II. Um, and then it goes beyond World War II, obviously, because it runs for um, 13 years, the series uh, did. But if you're looking for a smart British mystery set in beautiful coastal, coastal England, south coast of England, with likable, very likable characters. I really enjoy Samantha Stewart, especially. And Detective Foyle, or DS, DS, uh, DCS Foyle, is very respectable. He's a gentleman, smart, intuitive, friendly, knows how to work with ever. I mean, just well-written. He's just well-written. And, um, Anyway, I'll be watching that the rest of the summer. And if you haven't watched this series yet, <laughs> like me, I think you will thoroughly enjoy it. I will include a link to, to, to a trailer for you to watch to get a taste. But you can watch that on um, Acorn TV um, and I stream mine through Amazon Prime. 
I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir or this week's Petit Plaisirs, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each episode where I'll recommend a book, a film, a show, a recipe, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. All right. Well, that's it for this episode, but I'll be back on the first Wednesday of August which happens to be the second with a brand new episode. And later in August, we will be celebrating, as we always do, the second full week in August, the annual French week. And it is the eighth annual this year. So excited to celebrate all things French. And I do hope you'll join me and consider becoming a top tier member as you'll have the opportunity to enjoy every single post as well as enter all of the giveaways. Until then, I'll be back and next time hopefully recording in my office on August 2nd. Thank you so much for tuning in and may your home become the sanctuary that rejuvenates you to savor every day all the more. Bonjour. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, with the shortened URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com. For more in-depth exploration of how to cultivate your own unique, simply luxurious life, pick up my new book, which became both a bestseller and number one new release in France Travel, The Road to Le Papillon, Daily Meditations on True Contentment, available in all four formats for your preferred reading or listening. My first book, titled Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, and my second book, Living the Simply Luxurious Life, are also available in each of the four formats. Readers can now join the more intimate, the Simply Luxurious Life international community by becoming members of the blog, which offers the benefits of ad-free reading site-wide, unlimited access and exclusive access to content on the blog, such as the monthly A Couple Moments with Shannon video chat, tours of my home Le Papillon, the monthly What Made Me Smile post, and monthly Ponderings post, as well as the exclusive opportunity to enter all of the giveaways during the annual French and British Weeks. To stay caught up on all things Simply Luxurious, the podcast, blog post, the cooking show, and receive exclusive news, as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart each new month, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Live's free monthly newsletter, arriving on the last day of each month in your inbox. There is also a weekly newsletter, which is also free, and arrives each Friday to keep you caught up on the recent weekly posts on the blog. Enjoy with a hot cuppa or cup of morning coffee, and stay in the know about all things Simply Luxurious. Look for two new episodes of this podcast on the first and third Wednesday of each month. And until next time, I'm your host, Shannon Ables. Thank you for tuning in. Bonjour.